Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Molly Pepper, the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Programs here in the School of Business. And this is our weekly forum where we gather as a community and talk about things that are important to us as a business school. So I'm gonna hand it over to uh, our, our Dean, Dr. Ken Anderson, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Molly. Welcome to everyone on this Monday afternoon. Happy you could join us. Um, a couple of reminders before we get going. Number one would be to make sure that you are muted uh, appropriately. Uh, the second would be that we are recording this and it will be posted uh, later today or tomorrow at our Zag Business YouTube channel. Um, if you do have questions uh, for uh, Will, our speaker today, uh, please submit them via the chat. Uh, that'll be the easiest way for Molly and I to uh, coordinate and organize and, and keep a handle on things. Uh, beyond those three announcements, we usually have a reflection and, and I would simply build on something that I, that I offered last week. Uh, and, and that is, uh, these are uh, extremely tumultuous times for our society and indeed for the world. Uh, the COVID crisis combined with uh, the tragic deaths of George Floyd and others and the resulting uh, issues surrounding racism in our society uh, are all concerning to us and giving us pause. Uh, I believe that as a, a Jesuit institution, particularly uh, a Jesuit business school, uh, we have uh, an obligation as educators to uh, not just educate, but uh, really attempt to figure out uh, how we and our community can make things better. And so I, I would take this opportunity to ask each of you, uh, if you have suggestions or ideas uh, no matter how small or how simple you may think they are, uh, about things that, that we can do as a business school, uh, I would appreciate hearing from you. Uh, you can email me directly at anderson at gonzaga.edu. Uh, but uh, again, the, the, the obligation that we have uh, in, in, at this particular time with these particular situations uh, is something that together uh, we need to, to face. And I, I believe that, that all of us pulling together, uh, we can do that. So uh, thank you for taking the time now or at some point uh, to offer uh, some ideas uh, for us. And, and we will do our best to uh, move things forward uh, in the business school. So with that, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to introduce uh, Will McCahill. Will is a 2013, right, graduate of uh, Gonzaga and our business school. Uh, he is now uh, a business manager at Microsoft. And so I, I, would, I would start as we normally do. Will, uh, thank you for being here and, and tell us a little bit about uh, your background uh, up until the time you left Gonzaga. Uh, all right, well, I mean, first of all, thanks for having me. Really excited to be here. I see a lot of familiar names over on the side. Uh, Andrew Brassich, who probably gave me the worst test score I've ever had on a tax test on his first uh, first round. It was really great. We got a 20-point curve to that, a few others. Um, just want to preface this. I looked through a couple of these previous videos uh, to see some people. 
I am not a CTO of Microsoft, like Stuart, who I see in there. Um, I'm not a bank senior VP. I'm just a business person working on video games, doing video game stuff. Um, so if you're looking for really deep, insightful stuff from leadership and these big companies, that's not me. I'm, uh, I'm just along for the ride for a lot of it. So, uh, all right. So I'll give a little bit of a preface on who I am. Uh, I grew up on, in the Seattle area. As a Husky fan growing up, not because I had any real reason to be a Husky fan, just because it was a big school that happened to be nearby. Uh, Gonzaga was the annoying school that came in and beat us at basketball every year and was frustrating to me up through high school. Then they offered me a scholarship, so I went out and checked it out, uh, visited Jepson, decided that I wanted to go do business, met with Bud Barnes, who I, I went into his office as a senior in high school knocked on the door and said hey like do you have a moment to chat about like some stuff i'm considering going to the school and the guy took me in to his office for 30 minutes and proceeded to give me like a full idea of like what each major was like and told me that i need to go into accounting because it was a great program at gonzaga and um, i had so much respect for him walking out of the room i decided that gonzaga was going to be the school that i was going to go to because uh, he was the dean i was certain it was going to be a fantastic program um, so went to Gonzaga, knowing that I was going to major in accounting, uh, found out what a CPA was and uh, found out that I needed 150 credit hours in order to go get that. Uh, so I added MIS, which I had a passion for computers, uh, really enjoyed tech stuff. Our high school senior prank was hacking school computers and, uh, you know, welcoming people to Windows XP prison edition and scaring all the teachers there. Um, and then uh, because I still had the credit space, I picked up finance as well um, at the end, which was the recommendation from my advisor, Dan Law. Um, so went to Gonzaga, like had a good time, did all like got through those courses. And uh, I was not a 4.0 student. I was not even really close to a 4.0 student. Um, but I did learn a ton uh, while I was there, um, and I was intentional about taking classes that I thought would be more difficult, but that I would learn a whole lot more from. So, uh, for instance, I could have taken the chemistry of making beer uh, for my science class, but instead I took the chemistry class with all of the chem majors that almost killed me and was like three hours of homework every single day. Um, but I learned a ton, and I still have like half of the periodic table memorized. So... Um, Upon graduation, I, uh, I didn't go to any of the big four. I didn't do any of that because, again, not a 4.0 student. Um, but I, well, I had some job offers available to me in Seattle, but I really wanted to stay in Spokane because my wife was uh, finishing up her uh, master's degree at Gonzaga at the time. So, yay, we're a Gonzaga family. Um, but she did, yeah, three years at, well, she's my age, but she was in her, her second year at Gonzaga doing marriage and family counseling. So wanted to stay in the Spokane area. Couldn't really find anything that was really what I wanted because I want to do something that was in tech and somewhat finance related. And uh, ended up uh, joining a small private equity backed company called, well, I won't name them here, but I made an incredible $13 an hour, um, which wasn't really what I was hoping for right out of school. Uh, so I, I got a lot of grief from uh, parents and family and all that about that. Uh, but I wouldn't say that it was the smoothest launch for me, but there I was married making $13 an hour um, in downtown Spokane. And, you know, paying $6 for parking when you're making $13 an hour is pretty rough. Uh, I applied to about 200 some odd jobs uh, while I was there looking as far as like post falls and everywhere else before I finally kind of gave up and said, all right, like I need to go where the opportunity is. And for me in tech, that was Seattle. So I uh, applied to a job, got a contract gig at Microsoft, which I saw as my foot in the door, worked there 11 to 12 hours a day until I was able to turn that into an FTE job, um, doing data analysis. Uh, I was an Excel specialist uh, doing a whole bunch of different things. Um, worked as kind of a, I guess, more of a data scientist, data analyst at, with like a business backing. Um, until, well, in some capacity with games, in some capacity with HoloLens, uh, doing like augmented reality stuff, um, and then back in games, doing a whole bunch of stuff there until I came to where I am now, which is uh, we have a whole bunch of different game studios at Microsoft. My studio is one of them, and I'm the business lead for that, and then the data group actually reports up to me. 
Um, so for everybody who's on this call, if you're looking for a job and you weren't able to find one, I'm certain that you're going to do better than I did. Uh, but the economic landscape was much, much better at the time that I was looking for a job than it is now. So don't give up. <laughs> There's hope. Uh, my sister just graduated with a 4.0 GPA just about, um, and she's still looking for a job. So it's a, uh, yeah, tough time. So um, talk a little bit about, uh, I know you had at least one inter internship with PACAR. That's talk right. Talk a little about the role of, of the internship with your career development, your, your ultimate search uh, for Microsoft, et cetera. Sure, yeah. Uh, so I will say that Microsoft and PACAR, and PACAR for those who don't know what it is, is uh, it's a really great established company that's in um, like the Seattle area. And they've got a couple of different places all over the world, actually. They've got Kenworth trucks. I don't know if you people know what that is. Uh, they've got DAF and they've got Peterbilt. So those, they make those trucks. And um, as a manufacturing company, it's a very traditional type company. So uh, you wear suits into the office. Uh, you wear, like, you have timed breaks where it's like, hey, here's like your 15 minutes off. You're at work at eight o'clock, right? It's very scheduled out. Um, and I, I went there as an intern my junior year and learned a whole lot, did an internal audit thing with accounting and walked away from that saying, I definitely do not want to work in accounting. That was super hard. And wow, that was like getting in at 8 a.m. every single day and wearing a suit is not really the thing that I wanted to do. Um, so that compared to Microsoft, which um, also it's, it's a bit bigger of a company right now. I think it's 1.4 trillion right now. But uh, within the gaming org, if I wear a suit, nobody will talk to me like at all. They'll just look at me and be like, who's this guy? What is, is he interviewing for a job? What, what's his deal? Uh, so I, I kind of balance as a business manager, like I'm between the finance org and I'm between production. So when I'm meeting with production, I'm wearing a t-shirt and like with some sort of game on it. I'm like, yeah, I'm one of the guys here. This is great. Like, look, look at all of us here, like making video games. And then I go over to finance and I'm like, oh, well, I'm very put together. Like I've got like my business casual set up and like, you can trust me with a hundred million dollars. It'll be fine. Trust me. Like, just, just give me the cash and we'll, we'll make things work. Um, and that is a little bit more what I, I think I was looking for, uh, in, in my work. Like, um, my, I used to have a 8 a.m. stand-up meeting with my team where I'd make them all wake up at 8 a.m. And then I realized I was getting emails at midnight because most of them were night owls. So now we have a 9 a.m. stand-up meeting. So that way they actually get some sleep in there. <laughs> uh, so any maybe. other uh, any other big lessons from the PACAR internship? Um, you know what? Uh, so I, I think the big thing is that it's a very, uh, well, for me, like my takeaway was, hey, company culture is something that really matters and you need to gel with that company culture. And there's a lot of people there that really enjoyed that company culture and they liked the idea of having something tangible that they were building and they're like going forth and like, building trucks and they loved looking at all the truck stuff. I'm not really a car guy. Uh, I'm not really a truck guy. So I, I didn't really quite fit into that. Um, and then like having the defined schedule, like a lot of people love that regimen. Like they're up every single day at 6 a.m. and then they're moving on. Like they eat breakfast, they're done by 6.30 and then like they're moving on to all those other things. Um, and that like, that's great. It just wasn't really what I was looking for, I guess. <laughs> Um, I, I, I do, you know, I have a lot of respect for PACAR and the company and the people that are there. Uh, it just is a very, very, very different culture than any of the other companies that I've been at, to be honest. Um, so, so did, uh, and I think I, I know the answer to this and I'm, I'm not trying to lead you a particular way, but, uh, <laughs> I assume off that experience and the impact that it had on you in terms of your thoughts about accounting as a career and then your understanding of, of company culture mm -hmm. that you would, you would tell our students today that internships are, are critical. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, definitely go and intern in whatever field you think you want to go into because that's going to tell you what that field is actually like. Um, for me, I love sitting with data. I love, you know, looking up new tech and figuring out how different things are put together and trying to build business cases out of it. Um, for a number of my friends that I graduated with that were accounting majors, 
they love going in and doing audit stuff or they love tax. I'll never understand the people who love tax, but they do exist and they really seem to enjoy it. Um, but you know, everybody's wired differently and they didn't necessarily know that they loved tax until they got into it. Um, but it, yeah, an internship in whatever field you want to go into is absolutely invaluable. So definitely I would recommend going and finding an internship, especially at a company um, that is similar to the one that you want to work in to really get an idea of what your job's going to be like. And to be yeah. fair, a lot of those internships are really hard to get. Um, Gonzaga does a good job of putting people in the right place and connecting people with recruiters, but um, it, is, it is still a very competitive space and it seems to be getting more competitive with time. So um, even if you're able to get something that's in related, I would go and take it just so you can see what it's like. Very cool. So talk a little bit about what you do today at Microsoft. Yeah, great. So um, Microsoft, big company, uh, $125 million in revenue last year, I think. Uh, Xbox, about 10% of that. Pretty small by comparison, but still fairly large business. Within Xbox, there's the hardware team, there's the software team. So within software, there's the first party game studios and there's about 12 of those right now. Um, so within that, like, within that group, like there's the big studios. Most people here have probably heard of Minecraft, Halo, Forza, those games. Um, and then there's kind of the more up and comer, smaller studios. So my studio is one of those. So I work specifically on a game called Age of Empires, which has uh, several million people that are playing that game worldwide. Um, but it's an older game, it's 20 years old, and Microsoft didn't invest into it for a long time, so now we're revamping that franchise. So my job consists of three things within that. Uh, there's the data side, there's the business side, and then the strategy. So with data, uh, I'll explain a little bit about what data looks like for us. Um, we track everything that users do within video games, like everything, uh, because the more data you have about users that can inform your decisions, the better decisions you can make. So a really great example of that is if you look at Facebook and you see an ad for a Facebook uh, game that's up there, um, somebody is buying that ad. Well, those ads are bought in blocks and people pay a certain amount of money per user for those blocks. So let's say it's $5 to go buy like each user within those ads and Facebook gets paid off of the installs. So me as a company goes to Facebook and says, hey, I wanna target US users that have an interest in strategy gaming um, and have logged into Facebook in the last 12 days and I don't know, had a kid in the last six months, something like that. And then Facebook will deliver those users, the ad on my behalf, I will pay Facebook that money and then I will track those users specifically through the game. So those users install the game, I'm tracking those users as these are my Facebook users. And first day you have 100% of them, they're all playing the game and a certain percentage of them are gonna monetize and spend money in it, but then it gets smaller, right? So Day two, you're normally looking at 35% of those people are still around. Day seven, it's around 15. Day 30, it's like 3%. Depends on the game, but that's generally what the curve looks like. So we sum that curve and say, all right, well, out of this cohort, the average number of days that somebody's going to play is, let's say, 15. And then we're going to multiply that by the amount of revenue we get from these users on average per day that they play to give us the overall how much money we think we're going to get from each one of these users when they come in. So there's two main things there, right? Which is how well can you retain users? Because if you can retain users better, you're gonna have more days that they're spending money. So you can spend more for those users. And if you are able to monetize them better. So if you're able to bring in more things for them to spend money on or uncap the amount of money that they can spend, you get more users or you get more money from those users. So every single game has a different strategy. We're all competing in the same space. We're all buying users the same way. And everybody is basically trying to optimize that retention curve because it's pretty easy to optimize a retention curve compared to giving people 15,000 different ways to buy something and they're just gonna walk away from your game and say, look, I, I don't even know what I'm buying anymore. This is too ridiculous, I don't like it. Um, so the data side, you've got kind of a spreadsheet and this is how it plugs in. So software engineers are implementing the, uh, well, actually I'll start, data scientist, sits in the middle and says, hey, I want to put into one into the game. There's all these different business questions. They go talk to the test team, the design team, whoever. And they say, tell me all the things that you want to answer. Um, and then uh, basically they compile that. They create an events list and say, all right, well, we want events to trigger for this game at these different points in time. So if somebody goes to this level and fights this boss, an event is triggered. If they die, an event is triggered. 
And then we can track and watch how users at scale are moving through the game. So software engineering implements it. A data engineer then takes that data and pipes it through from the game into whatever tables we need. And then the data scientist is going to look at it, run all sorts of stats on it, and try to find gaps and drops in retention and other things like that. And then your data analyst, business analyst person is going to look at it and try to translate that information into something that's usable for our production staff, our designers, audio, art, whoever it is, so they can go address whatever the problems are that the data has found. So basically the whole thing there, like all those different people are just trying to optimize the game, make it better, make it stickier, make it more interesting to people, and make them more likely to spend money in that game over time. And uh, so that's, that's kind of the data side. So I, I manage a small team that does that. Um, then there's the business side, which is like, I'll go to finance with some producer and say, hey, we want to go make a video game. Can you give us some money? We'll pay you back. And we'll pay you back with interest. Um, hopefully not too much interest, but some interest. Uh, so finance gives us money and then we sometimes pay it back. And normally that's okay. <laughs> and um, we'll go sign a game with a studio the executive producer will go find the right production house because they're, you know, some industry vet that's been doing it for a long time. They'll go find a game studio that will make the game on our behalf. Um, and then we go through milestones, we go through the full development process, and then we get to launch, we decide on what the price is going to be, we release the product, and then we iterate on it. We make it better over time, we try to improve it, we keep users longer, we make them happier, whatever it is, whether that's from testing side, design, whatever. Um, and then the last thing is kind of strategy. So I'm looking out at the market, trying to figure out where is the market going right now? How can I go be competitive in that market space? Um, one particular interest area for me right now is esports. Um, we've got 10 million plus hours of people watching Age of Empires on Twitch right now. Um, that's kind of like the new modern marketing for video games. Uh, it's a $1.7 billion industry, so it's pretty small compared to gaming, which is over 100 billion. Uh, I think gaming is actually around $150 billion a year right now in gross spend, um, but it's growing fast. It's got a compound annual growth rate of 15.7%. Um, Dota specifically had a prize pool of $34 million last year. Um, and the number of people who came in and viewed it and watched it and did all that uh, exceeded the MLB um, for overall video games, not Dota specifically. Um, Blizzard's Overwatch uh, League had 12, 12 founding members at $20 million per franchise, I think. And then later expansions were 30 to $60 million to go buy in and just be a part of it. And they have all sorts of sponsors and other things like that that go along with it because everybody realizes that that's really where a lot of your high spend users are. Um, and it is the modern advertising. So my job is to go figure out, well, how do we go and engage this 20 year old franchise with something like that, right? So there's, there's a whole lot of different things along the way that I'm looking at trying to uh, go do. So that's, that's kind of a bit of the overview of what I'm up to. Um, are there any questions out of that? Or do you wanna move on to COVID impact? <laughs> well, let me ask you one thing uh, before we move on to COVID. Uh, and, and you touched on this a little bit, but, and, and don't give away any big secrets, obviously. <laughs> But what's, what's the next big thing in your world? Ooh. Uh, well, for, uh, for me, so I, my studio specifically focuses on PC gaming, um, which is not really how most people think about Xbox. So we're trying to go figure out, well, how do we define a PC user versus a console user? Because they are very different. There's a lot more of them. They're lower spend on average. Um, and like Xbox is... Uh, Pretty, like if you look at MPD data, they're gonna tell you that it's pretty US, maybe a little bit Europe centric. It's not really a whole lot of Xboxes in Asia. PC, on the other hand, is huge in Asia. Um, they've got PC gaming cafes, they've got all sorts of different things there. So um, there's a lot of different frontiers right now, um, as far as gaming goes. Certainly for Xbox right now, like at least my job is to go help try to figure out how we make it big in the PC space. Um, and those, like, really there's three cohorts within um, gaming. You've got your console, which is your Xbox, PlayStation. You've got PC, and then you've got uh, mobile. Mobile's the biggest by far. Um, by revenue, console's the second biggest, but by users, PC is the second biggest. And console and PC are pretty close in terms of revenue. But uh, obviously an American consumer spends a whole lot more money than a Vietnamese consumer does. Um, just different cost of living. 
Uh, so yeah, so what is the new horizon? Well, for me, that's what it is, but um, there's a lot of people that are pushing into VR. Maybe in 10 years, that'll be a big thing. Uh, Microsoft doesn't have a VR play that I'm aware of right now uh, in gaming. Uh, we, we kind of focused on HoloLens, which was more augmented reality, which is a bit different. Um, definitely like seeing growth in streaming and that sort of thing. Microsoft acquired Mixer. There was a reason that they did that. That was a strategic thing for them. Um, if you look at something like Twitch during this latest downturn, I think their year over year is 27% growth in total watched hours. Um, so th those are spaces that I think are, are big. Um, and I also think that gaming kind of flies under the radar, right? So you have uh, GTA V. In 2013, when it launched, it made $800 million in the first day, and it made a billion dollars over its first weekend. Um, you compare that to like The Force Awakens, which I think everybody knew about here, um, and that was like $750 million over its first whole weekend. So like, I don't really think that when people think, you know, size of franchise that they think GTA versus Star Wars, but it, it's huge, it's massive. Total box office revenue for that matter is like what forty billion dollars a year, and gaming's way more than that, more than double. Okay. So. Interesting. So you brought it up. Talk a little bit about how COVID has affected uh, your day to day, your relationship with your team, uh, the product, etc. Yeah, sure. So. Um, Obviously my day-to-day -day is I, I sit at home. I'm probably gonna be sitting at home for a really, really long time uh, <laughs> because I don't really need to be in the office. I'm not less productive sitting at home than I am at the office. Um, there's certainly a bit loss of like iterating on stuff super fast. Um, I would say as far as business goes, the biggest impact for us is probably on test resources because you don't want the testers to take the software home because stuff can happen to software that goes home. Um, you kind of want it to be on site and so figuring out how to like set them up with the latest tech so they're able to access software through some sort of remote portal, like a Teradici car or something like that. Like that's, that's something that's been tricky, but it's not really something that I've had to figure out because I'm the business guy. So I don't really care about tests, but what's, it's an important thing. They just cross charge me for it at the end. So it's probably just gonna be a little bit more expensive, but um, I would say development timelines probably moved out uh, for a lot of these different games. I know that there's a lot of studios that have been struggling to meet kind of those last second deadlines because crunch is very much a thing within our industry. Um, and it's really hard to do crunch when you're sitting at home with four kids in the background. Uh, but from a revenue and everything else perspective, um, I don't think there's been a better time for growth for video games. It's really awkward for me because I go into these meetings, I'm like, look, this is a very bad thing, very serious COVID, like everybody should be concerned about this. Um, but like, we also just had like the best quarter we've ever had in like my entire time at Microsoft. Um, and I, I don't really see that changing really very soon. Um, most games saw 2X the number of people playing them um, during this because everybody's sitting at home. What else are you going to go do? They're gonna go pop on and, you know, watch Netflix, play games, do some sort of entertainment that doesn't cost very much money. And gaming doesn't cost a ton of money to go and do in terms of hours of entertainment that you get for a $20 purchase of Minecraft. It's a lot of hours of entertainment that you're gonna get out of it. Um, so I guess maybe the big thing is we just saw acceleration of trends. So the esports side grew. Um, gaming and streaming, that sort of stuff, that all grew. Gaming subscription stuff, um, all of those different things that we had, like in my case, my studio launched a remastered version of a game. Well, a whole bunch of people came into the remastered version instead of the original. So we saw a lot more people, like, everything just accelerated uh, for that period. Um, and it obviously from our business perspective, like it hasn't, it pushed all of our sales digitally, which was something that we were already seeing for the past 10 years. Um, so that's, I guess that's really the, the big impact that we've had for COVID. Uh, as far as managing a team and other things like that remotely, like it's not actually that much different. Um, we still, like, I just don't have to commute, which is really nice. Um, I spend that time maybe going off and hiking or walking somewhere. Um, I guess I can't go to the gym. It's a pretty big deal, but <laughs> right. um, that, that's most of it. Okay. So the accelerator uh, 
part of this, uh, you know, we hear that gets thrown around around a lot, right? With mm -hmm. with COVID, uh, I assume that there's uh, a life cycle to a game. Uh, do you see <laughs> what we're going through COVID-wise accelerating the life cycle of a particular game? Not really. Um, so what it really did is it brought a lot of casual consumers into the industry. Um, people who may have been on the fence before about doing something, uh, well, their friends are all playing, you know, whatever game, so they jumped into. Um, every single game actually has a very different life cycle. So uh, the number one game in the world right now is League of Legends. Um, most of those consumers are in Asia, even though Riot is based out of, I think, San Francisco certainly California. Um, it's owned, backed by Tencent. So huge, huge in China. Um, tons of tournaments, tons of other things like that. They launched in 2009. And I think they make more money every year um, than they did the previous year. So they're certainly doing very well um, from that perspective right now. Um, and I don't, I don't really think it like accelerated their, their, hasten, like, their decline. So I guess maybe I should back up for a moment. Console games, normally you see a nice like spike at launch and then it falls off because you're on to the next thing. So um, like games like a, a Call of Duty, I don't actually have direct access to Call of Duty days so I can talk about it. So um, Call of Duty, you're gonna see a lot of people buy the game at, at its launch and then it's gonna fall off pretty fast because the next year there's a new Call of Duty game coming out. So nobody's gonna go buy the old Call of Duty, we can go buy the new Call of Duty, unless the new Call of Duty isn't that good which has happened on occasion, but generally speaking, nobody's gonna go buy the old Call of Duty um, when you can go buy the new one. So those ones have very short curves versus uh, like an Overwatch or a League of Legends, which every year see increasing user growth because the team is still working on the same game and trying to build it into something new. Uh, it's the same thing with mobile space. Uh, you look at the top mobile games, I think eight of the top 10 mobile games right now were the same top 10 that were there uh, five years ago. And it's because yeah. they're paying to stay in the same spot um, so they're buying a lot of users just to keep that slot, but at the same time, it's also because they're improving their formula. They're um, fixing those retention curves. There's a lot of work that goes into doing that. And so whenever you release a new game, you're just throwing all of that work that you had away. And nobody wants to do that, uh, especially in the mobile space because it's expensive. Okay. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Thank you. So, and, and remember, uh, those of you in the audience, don't forget to, to throw some questions our way. But uh, advice for our students, whether they are uh, just graduated and entering this really weird space, or whether they are in the middle of their college career, uh, what type of, of advice or lessons would you share with them? Uh, so, I mean, I talked a little bit earlier about how I had a difficult time starting out. I mean, $13 an hour was not really what I was looking for right out of school. Um, but I would say if you're in school right now, really like the number one thing that I would say is, hey, um, go figure out what your hard skill is going to be. Um, most businesses are looking like some of them are going to hire you because they like you. Um, but most businesses want to have some clear objective thing that you can go do for them. So like when I hired a data engineer, I'm not hiring that person necessarily for their personality. Like I want to like them. I want to like be able to work with them easily, but like fundamentally I'm hiring them because they have a specific skill set of something that, you know, is going to be useful. So, um, and in that case, like I would say a really great spot for younger people is like, we've grown up with technology. So go do technology things. Like I have a number of people that I work with that are executives, even at Microsoft that, don't necessarily understand a lot of the technology that they're working with. They certainly don't understand how to unlock like basic data things in SQL or something like that. Um, so go grab like a couple of classes. Like if you take one class in SQL, um, even if that's not what you want to end up doing, you can still leverage that to get your foot in the door at the company that you want to do and eventually end up where you want to be. Um, to the students that are, you know, recently graduated. Um, I mean, it's, it's a, it is an incredibly difficult time uh, to be looking for a job. Uh, I can empathize with looking for a job and being frustrated. I mean, literally 200 job applications that I sent out. I got out of that, I got eight interviews. I got eight second round interviews and I got zero offers in Spokane. 
And that is super depressing. Um, so my advice would be just keep putting yourself out there. Like I was obviously applying to jobs that I was nowhere near qualified for, but I just wanted to throw it out there and see if something stuck. So I was throwing out as many job applications as I could. Um, it's tough to put yourself out there. So don't get discouraged on that. And also know that like, you can always fall back on the, Hey, like I happen to be like going into the market at the same time as we have 13% unemployment, um, which is historic uh, by any measure. So um, use the time, or at least what I did was I used that time to go and find uh, new hard skills for myself. So I got a Microsoft office special like specialization in Excel because I knew that Excel was something that was used frequently in the business community. And Excel was something that I didn't mind doing and I thought that I could be good at it, so I did. I took the class, went through it, figured it out. Um, I got my real estate license in that window. I have not worked a day in real estate, but I was just looking for something to make myself more marketable with some sort of hard skills um, to a lot, a lot of the uh, businesses that I was applying for. So okay. like, cool. go do stuff like that. Um, while you're on the interim. And if you can, you know, like keep on putting your name out there. It can get discouraging. Okay, here's a question. Can you talk about trends with uh, women in gaming? Oh yeah, so my boss is actually the sponsor of the Women in Gaming Initiative at Microsoft and Xbox. Um, so it's, it's very something that's very important to our team. Um, so I would say there's, it depends on where you look. Um, where you see like basically in like market segments that have figured out how to best engage with women in gaming. So within first person shooters, uh, they've historically skewed very heavily male. Um, even like, if you look at strategy games, it's like 90% male. Uh, but if you look at games like uh, Solitaire, like I don't know if anybody's played the Microsoft Solitaire here, but that's like 65% female. Um, and most of them are like 50 plus. Um, and so like they figured out a model that better engages with that group. So I don't think you're gonna find many people in gaming that are not trying to figure out, hey, what is it that women are looking for uh, within games and how do I best engage with them and make it so it's not a toxic culture for them because a lot of games have a very masculine toxic culture. Um, so the thing that we've done and what a lot of studios have done is we like have initiatives within the studio where like somebody is sitting there and they're looking at the game and saying, Hey, like, I need to understand this particular product from a, like from a woman's perspective or from my perspective as like a female gamer, what is it that I want to see in this game that is not currently there? Um, and there's a lot of things like that. Um, so I would say like, I personally am not somebody who can be an expert on women in games. I still haven't gotten my wife to play Age of Empires with me. I've really tried, um, but she, it's just not really her game. Uh, but there are uh, a lot of other games that we do play together. Uh, one that's really great is Ori in the Blind Forest. It's a gorgeous game, and it is kind of like an adventure story game. She loves that kind of thing. Um, that's probably her favorite game right now. So. Okay. Um, I would say like, it's definitely a focus for the industry. Um, but in general, like we're trying to figure out how to go and engage more than really just white American guys who uh, <laughs> like to play video games in the evenings um, and some European people. Uh, like that's kind of a, a good chunk of the Xbox group right now. And so like, how do we go broaden that? Like, there's a okay. huge market out there that we're just, is currently untapped. So, so building on, on uh, some of the things you said earlier, a, a question from your good friend Tatao. Uh, <laughs> an interest, is interest in video gaming necessary uh, for a job in your team or which is more important, interest in gaming or hard skills? <laughs> Uh, so I'll say that we hire for the hard skills. Um, so the hard skills will get your foot in the door. Uh, but interest in gaming makes it so that it's not a job so much as it is something that is fun to do that you like to do. So, um, there, there are people on my team right now who are not heavy gamers or they don't like playing the specific game that, um, I, or that we're working on. Um, and that's okay. But 
Um, the people who really are able to engage with it and have a lot of fun while they're working are the people who actually are gamers themselves. So um, I would definitely say learn the hard, like learn the hard skills regardless. If you happen to like games, sure. But send me your name, <laughs> send me your resume. Okay. We'll talk. Yeah, every time I see a question like that, I think of walking across Nike's campus and uh, hearing about their explosive growth in, in number of employees and some folks lamenting the fact that they have new employees who don't know who Michael Jordan is. Uh, and, and, you know, so it kind of speaks to this interest in the product or the service versus just a cold hard skill set right so it's just kind of interesting uh what about the non-academic uh co-curricular extracurricular or, or even your uh non-business courses at gonzaga how did all of that uh impact you and, and what you do today uh, so I would say the biggest thing there as far as non-business classes is probably just the focus on critical thinking. So, um, I mean, I went to a liberal arts high school growing up, um, but then also first two years at Gonzaga is very much liberal arts focus. Mm -hmm. um, so being able to look at problem like, there's not always perfect math to go and do what you want to do. There's not always like a really obvious answer that you can prove out say, yeah, this is obviously the right thing to do. Like sometimes you have to sit down and just think about a problem and like have that white space to really be able to engage with it properly and come up with something that is way better than what the data would have predicted or something along those lines. Um, if for a very specific example, I took uh, a bit of Latin and uh, like we use that for our Age of Empires 4 pitch where we asked for a whole bunch of money and just wrote out some Latin script in there saying like how great it was. Um, so th there, there's random things like that, that I don't know if that was helpful or not. Um, I, I did correct my, at the time, boss on his uh, fourth declension nominative <laughs> verb. But um, yeah, that was, that was about the extent of the use that I got out of that. So um, being able to go in and have a conversation with somebody, though, and be able to engage with not just the, like, okay, I'll say, I'm a very analytical person. I like to sit in the numbers. I like to look at data. Like that is my happy place. Um, unfortunately, people are people and there's other reasons that they do things that aren't necessarily predicted by those trends. So as much as I would love to reduce everything to just, oh yeah, like I have a thousand users and I had 350 the next day and I had 150 seven days later or whatever it is, um, there's reasons that exist beyond that. Um, and I think that's really the difference between like a data scientist who's looking and like doing stats and doing all sorts of cool analysis on it. And then somebody who's actually understanding the crux of the business problem and looking at it and really deconstructing why is it that this thing is happening. And I think that's a critical thing that you really get in your non-business class. You get those in your other courses because it really lets you, I guess, complete as a human being and think um, more holistically. Okay, cool. And that, that's a very common type of response we get from our alums you know oh, the, great. Uh, oh, the value yeah, of, count me uh, in with that group <laughs> yeah the value of that liberal arts core uh last question for you sure. uh, another putting you on the spot here uh is your career long term you think it's going to focus on gaming or do you envision the possibility of a different role at microsoft uh in the future my boss on this thread I don't know. Let me check the group. <laughs> it seems like a kind of question she'd ask me. Um, so I don't actually know. Like, I enjoy games right now. It's very interesting. Um, like, again, like, I'm, I'm the kind of person who wakes up and, like, I'll, you know, go do my morning workout. Then I'll go work on video games all day. And then, like, the evening will come. I'll go play with uh, my kid and put her to bed and hang out with my wife for a little bit. And then I'll come back and play some more video games because I enjoy video games. Um, so I'm not looking to leave that immediately anytime soon. Uh, but, uh, that being said, at, at some point, like there, there are other things that interest me. So I haven't, haven't quite decided. I'm still in my twenties. So I've got, I've got some time to think about it. <laughs> Good answer. 
That, that's a good answer. Well, Will, uh, thank you very much for taking the time to be, to be with us today. Uh, I think we all learned a lot, especially those of us uh, on the call that are maybe uh, a little further along in our journey and not quite as uh, gaming uh, sophisticated as we should be. So uh, thank you and, and thank you for the advice uh, you gave our students. I think that's gonna be uh, helpful as well. So thanks to everybody who attended. Uh, appreciate it uh, very much. And if you have any ideas or suggestions for us along the lines of the issues we talked about uh, at the beginning uh, of this program, uh, I certainly would enjoy uh, hearing from you on those issues. So thank you, everybody. Thanks for the time today, everybody. Take care. Thank you, Will.